This episode is about minutes 66 through 70 of The Empire Strikes Back with new guest, Dr. Lauren Crosby. Hello there, and welcome to Star Wars Music Minute, where we celebrate the music and sound of Star Wars five cinematic minutes at a time. I'm Chrysanthi Tan, feel free to call me Xanthi, and today is all about minutes 66 through 70 of The Empire Strikes Back. There is so much jam-packed into this set of minutes. We start with the end of Luke's magic tree uh, trial, where he sees his face in Vader's helmet mask. Um, And then we meet Boba Fett for the first time, or, you know, we just see Darth Vader speaking to him and, you know, other bounty hunters. Um, There's so much that happens. Um, We also have the beginning of Yoda trying to lift his X-Wing, and we have the duo... Do or do not, there is no try portion. Um, It's jam-packed. The reason that I specifically am excited to have Dr. Lauren Crosby on today is because this is the first time we hear the Boba Fett theme. And um, music theorist, you're a music theorist, Lauren, um, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and you just recently gave a presentation about, basically about this topic at the John Williams conference. I did, that's correct. Um I got to go to Every France and talk about the connections between William's original Boba Fett theme that we hear here for the first time and the theme that Gorenson writes for the book of Boba Fett. Um, So this will be a little bit of a crossover between those two different topics coming together, those two different uh, contexts for Boba Fett, Um, but both can be thought of as kind of derived from the same musical materials. I'm very interested in getting into this subject, Um, but of course we will cover um, all of the minutes, so we won't only talk about that. However, when we get to the Boba Fett theme, we will be spending a little bit more time on it than perhaps I would have if I were doing it alone. So um, very glad to have you. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you for inviting me. Um, There's, why don't we start out with just listening to the beginning of these minutes and then we can sort of uh, go in in chronological order in talking about stuff. All right, so at the beginning of um, minute 66, here we are. So that's the first 30 seconds. And I'll let it take us to this transition. Okay, let's stop there. Great. Wow. Um, For anyone who knows this movie very well, I bet that, I bet you are seeing the scene play out in front of you there with Luke looking at his face. That really scarred me as a child. It was a big surprise. It was a big surprise. Um, Well, certainly it wasn't a big surprise this time, but I remember (laughs) the very first time it was a big surprise. Uh, And expecting, I think, musically, it's a surprise as well, because like you're so expecting to see Vader. And then I think for me, at least, I'm so expecting to hear Vader. And then we hear like Luke's theme and see Luke's face instead. Um, So it's, as equally a listening surprise as it is a a visual surprise and the two kind of going together there. Oh, that's a good point. Yeah. Because when Luke's theme comes in there, it, I mean, I guess the metaphor, if, at least as it, what it means to me is sort of that Luke is seeing himself as maybe his worst fear or is maybe seeing, you know, a fear that connects him with Darth Vader. Mm-hmm. Um, I know we're not talking about this movie now, but I see parallels with this and The Rise of Skywalker with um, Rey kind of her fear or her, um, yeah, basically her fear being that she is related to Palpatine, which is perhaps the only thing worse than being related to no one. Um, (laughs) That's true. Yeah, so. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, and interesting, I think, parallel there. And then, like, not only do we get Luke's theme, um, but it's like a very 
dark and dissonant version of that theme. It's in minor instead of major. And then there's this like tension uh, musically with what's going on in the strings right before. We've got this like high G and then the theme comes in on a C sharp, which is a tritone away. So that like dissonance there as well, kind of bringing out um, that this is a, not just a happy Luke theme, but a dark Luke theme. Oh, okay. Let's, let's hear that again. So you, maybe you can point it out as we're hearing it. Yeah, absolutely. Sweet. Okay. I'm just going to start right at the beginning. Love that timpani right there. It's great. So we hear the real high there. Yeah. Okay. And then that like tritone leap down to where the, uh, um, sorry, I think I said it was strings. It's not strings. Um, but we have like the high pitch and then a drop down that creates that real dissonant interval um, where the theme starts and comes in. Yeah. Um, and even leading up into that, there are, okay, the, the techniques sort of being used all really lead I don't know well let's I want to call attention to the okay this pizzicato right here mm -hmm. the timpani thing which is mm -hmm. pretty um it's like almost a symbol at least in like western romantic music it's like almost a symbol for heads rolling yeah absolutely <laughs> <laughs> um and the head does literally roll exactly exactly <laughs> And then we have that, that tremolo right there, that very low, mm -hmm. um, or, you know, very, the celli that are doing a, you know, they're moving their bows really fast and it's really low. So it's creating this grumble, um, right here. Yeah. And then that high sustained, um, pitch is that, that tension. Yeah, it's like what? So it's a tritone. So that would be like I can't. What instruments do you think are making that high pitch? Is that the synthesizer, or is it like piccolo? I'm I'm not sure what is uh, exactly going on up there. It might be like a synth. It certainly is like multiple instruments are sort of doing a, a stab at it. It seems like yeah, yeah, yeah. It's such an interesting texture contrast. Oh, I'm hearing like a xylophone hit too. Mm hmm Yeah. Yeah. And this... Yoda's theme. Mm-hmm. Oh my gosh, that harp led, um, you know... Um, you know what that reminds me of? Um, it reminds me of Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. Uh, okay. It's sort of doing that like, like it goes down a half step and then up a whole step, but all in all, you're having three notes separated by half steps. I mean, I guess it's not like an unusual thing totally, but um, it reminds me of... This is the beginning of the pure imagination section. It like kind of reminds me uh, the the ear, the creepiness of it. Um, mm -hmm. It's not really the same order of notes, uh, but yeah, I don't know. Just sometimes these associations pop up. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, okay, so let's let's continue listening. Um, well, it is interesting. I'll say that the that Luke's theme kind of flows into Yoda's theme there. Mm -hmm. R two. <laughs> Imperial March.
bounty hunters. We don't need that scum. Also. No. Those rebels won't escape us. So, we have a priority uh. signal from the Star Destroyer Avenger. Right. And now we're hearing something. Be a substantial reward for the one who finds the Millennium Falcon. You are free to use any methods necessary. So that's Boba Fett's theme. It is. It's kind of the the start of it. Um, yeah. And we don't quite see Boba Fett on screen yet when that's going on, um, but we get bounty hunters, so we know he's coming. Um, and we have that kind of musical signal first, and then it continues as Vader has a a conversation, albeit a short conversation, with Boba Fett. So Boba Fett's music precedes Boba Fett, um, which is which is kind of interesting. And I will say that, well, audience poll, I guess, um, when did you first become aware that Boba Fett had a theme? I would be curious um, how many people picked up on it or mm -hmm. if it's a more recent discovery. I don't, I'm curious because it yeah. isn't like, it's not like on the level of the force theme or something like that. It, it, you could miss it. You could easily miss it. And honestly, um, I'm going to take this as my moment to shout out to uh, Frank Lehman and his uh, wonderful catalog of Star Wars themes. Um, in my own research and listening, I was noticing all these things going on um, with the Book of Boba Fett themes and thinking I was going to go in a different direction with a paper on that. And then I was like, wait, does Boba Fett have a theme? Like, did John Williams <laughs> give him a theme to begin with? Um, and honestly, I didn't know. And I went and looked and was like, listened and and referenced uh, the catalog and realized like, yes, but also you hear it like two and a half times and that's it in the entire nine film collection. So it would be really easy to miss because you hear it like two and a half times and only in episode five. And then that's it. Okay, that's that's validating. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> because I missed it until, you know, last, until the book of Boba Fett as well. Well, it, well you know, until a couple of years ago, I'd say. Um yeah. and even listening to it now, it's so it's so low pitched mm -hmm. and buried that I don't know, I don't think I would have thought that's a theme for sure. Um I think I would have thought I don't know, it's just part of the underscore or something. Yeah. I would have originally thought that as well. And I think with everything that's going on, like there's, there's a lot of dialogue going on. You've got Vader in the room. So you have the respirator noises. You've got like the sounds of the ship and other things kind of going on in the room. And it's a very noisy scene to introduce a brand new theme in. Usually when we hear a new theme, you don't have quite as much going on and it's not quite as buried. Um, it is a noisy way to introduce a theme. It really it is. is. Um, okay, so let's listen to it uh, at the beginning of the track attacking a Star Destroyer so we can hear it without the, the other noise. <laughs> um yeah can you explain what you are what you are hearing in that theme i mean i guess we both can but i don't want to uh you know much more about this theme than me for me the thing that strikes me most is the instrument is the super low like bassoon contra bassoon mm -hmm. i think that's definitely something that stands out to me that instrumentation um the register you have this very low contra bassoon kind of sound. Um, and then for me, what stands out are um, the intervals. So listening for how far apart those different individual pitches are and hearing that ba, da, 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 kind of as two different ideas. Um, and then a little bit of decoration on that. And then we go to the da um, up above it. So hearing it as kind of these three different 
pieces um, that fit together to make a larger theme? Yes. Um, let's see. If Okay, I'm going to show a few, a couple different views of this. So first okay. I will show, um, I will, will this work? All right, it will work. <laughs> Just one second. Okay, first I'm going to show um, the theme as a lot of listeners and viewers are aware of Frank Lehman's catalog. So I'll show you how mm -hmm. Frank writes it in, in the catalog, which is... Um, I'm going to play it up higher because it's just easier to hear. Um, it is. And then repeat. Okay, so the motion, they're the intervals that you're describing. You're hearing a half step there. Mm -hmm. And so you're talking about that. Um, and other things that go beyond it. I, I guess I didn't finish playing it. Okay. <laughs> My bass clef brain is being tested. I'm like, wow, it's been a while since I practiced <laughs> piano. <laughs> uh, oh my gosh. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then, and then the tritone. Yep. Yeah. Um, and then Lauren has done a transcription as well. So let me show you that and then I don't want to give away too much of it yet because there's some annotations on it but um all right so just look at the top <laughs> let's just look at the top one um yeah, yeah mine's a little bit different in a couple of ways um and I was certainly aware of of um Frank Lehman's transcription mm -hmm. um and he puts it in uh B flat octatonic um and then starting on a d flat rather than a c sharp so i take the enharmonic route and mm -hmm. to me i hear it more like in c sharp minor um so oh here we have a comparison that's kind of okay. yeah the side by side i decided to go with primarily sharps instead of primarily flats mm -hmm. um in order to situate it in sort of a c sharp minor um tonal center rather than a B flat octatonic collection. Oh, interesting. Is is that because you're just not really? Can you say more about the choice? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so for me, that um, first half step uh, that we have there, um, hearing that as like a do t do in a key, or that kind of half step between scale degree one, stepping down to scale degree seven and stepping back to scale degree one. Um, mm -hmm. since it's kind of the first thing that we hear in this new theme, um, a lot of times we default to hearing that as like home or that's like your tonic, your main pitch of the key. Uh, so for mm -hmm. me, hearing that as like a default to this is kind of the center. Um, and then it gives us a great place too, where between the second and sixth scale degree in a minor scale, you have that tritone happening. Um, so it kind of fits everything nicely within a single key context. Um, if you think of it as the starting pitch being C sharp instead of D flat and it fitting in the key of C sharp minor. Oh, okay. 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 There are a couple things that I want to, um, go back and explain. So, okay. okay. So the bottom, okay. So the people who are viewing on YouTube, the bottom transcription is Frank Lehman's and the top transcription is Lauren's. Um, so Frank, you can see, well, he has this little thing that says B flat octatonic. So that would be, um, a B flat would be this note. And so he, he's imagining it in this, this being the tonal center, not necessarily like an oct for an octatonic um, collection of pitches. Um, you're imagining this as the tonal center. Yes. A C sharp because in C sharp minor. Mm -hmm. Um, so you're, you're basically, you're conceiving of it in two different quote unquote, like scales. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. And so for you, so, f okay. So for you, because the theme starts on a C sharp, whereas in 
Frank's version, the C sharp compared to the C sharp in the context of a B flat tonal center would be like, you know, uh, I, don't, I don't know if scale degree would be the appropriate term, but it would be like the third or some second right. or third or something, you know, the third right. note in his scale. But for you, this is the so first the, note of the scale. So, so it just orients like, it just kind of like put, makes the line start at a different place. Um, yeah. And so when you're saying do T, you're, um, okay, listeners, if you're familiar with Mary, is Mary Popper? <laughs> no, no, Sound of Music. Sound of Music. Yes. <laughs> That's what it is. Um, Sorry, I like just got done teaching oral skills and I just can't turn the solfege off in my brain. It's just no, going to come totally, out. <laughs> it's totally, no, it's totally good to, to describe. So, um, yeah, so then I think, thank God for that song. Uh, Absolutely. Do a deer. I mean, it's. And everyone knows solfege, whether they know it or not. Um, so, um, do, 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 re, mi, fa, so. So, do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, do. Basically, all of those letter, all of those syllables map out to what music theorists would call scale degrees. Um, mm -hmm. And um, so, a do will always be a do is the tonic. So that's the one. And we've talked about this on the, on the podcast before. And we've talked about, um, you know, pitch classes and everything too. This is very, mm -hmm. it just, this is just like another name of, it's actually related to like pitch classes. Um, so do will always be one, re will always be two, me will be three, but then, um, there are also like, for example, if you're doing like a flat, or if you're doing like like a flat three instead of me, you would say may. And just there's little syllable um, things that you do when a note is like perhaps flattened or sharpened. But um, a T, do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, T is always the seventh, is the seventh scale degree, the one that, or the leading tone, the leading tone mm -hmm. to the do. So when you're talking about, when you earlier said do, T, do, or do, T, mm -hmm. you meant... Yeah. You meant one, seven. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Okay. One to seven, back to one within yeah. a scale context. Um, and I think it can go either way. I think there's certainly strengths to uh, hearing it as this B-flat octatonic collection as well. Um, it actually aligns a little bit more closely with what's going on when we get to the Book of Boba Fett theme, um, because mm. that one's more like starting on the third of the key. Mm -hmm. And so this one, the B flat mm. hearing aligns a little more closely with like hearing it as starting on the third of the key mm -hmm. rather than hearing it as starting on the first the one. degree of the key, the one. Um, so kind of the like, are you hearing it as starting on a three or are you hearing it as starting on a one in the key context? Oh, and, that's uh, really interesting. Yeah. With this one, there's not a lot else going on around it. Um, like when we get to Gorenson's theme, there's also like scale degree one happening all the way through in the bass. So you have that to really center clear yourself anchor. against. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Mm -hmm. And here, like, you don't have a whole lot else going on um, to anchor as an anchor point. So I think yeah. it could be a little more ambiguous of, like, maybe you hear it as a one and maybe you hear it as a three. Oh, yeah, that's interesting. Because it would be, like, the difference between, like, do -do 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 or... That would be yeah. like imagining it in different, with different tonal centers. Very interesting. I guess that's one of the tricky, or one of the cool, you know, tricky things about this theme being less like harmonically specific than a lot of John Williams's other themes where there's such a clear like harmony and, and direction mm -hmm. and where even the harmony itself can evoke the theme without the melody. This one is like the opposite of that. It's like... I don't know, unison, it, bass and contrabassoon in unison. And they're the contrabass, like the, like the, um, like the string bass, whatever it's called, the, the cello bass, the contrabass, the yes. string bass. Wow. <laughs> My string card, <laughs> string player card revoked. Um, they're doing like these, like planing chords that are so low pitch that you, it, it doesn't, really even clearly register to me personally. Um, yeah. So, all right. So where were we in this discussion before this little divergent, this little side path? Well, not a side path. It's extremely related. Um, 
should we listen to the theme again so we have so we can uh, remember what we're talking about? So listeners sure. can remember what we're talking about? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> There's totally a DSCRA in there, huh? There is. There, is. there are so many in this five minutes. I was I like, know. DSCRA, DSC. Oh, it's a. <laughs> it was again and again and again. Um, but I kept hearing like, oh, there's a there's a DSCRA in this. Oh and yeah, in that. we're about so to get to. We a will lot. we will get to a lot of them. There are yeah. a lot in there. <laughs> Alex Ludwig, aka DSCRA guru, you are on notice mm-hmm. for this episode. So <laughs> I'm going to call upon you to give your assessment. <laughs> <laughs> um <laughs> okay let Okay, so that's the half step. Full step. And that's the tritone. Mm-hmm. Let's stop right there. Um So a tritone is a an augmented fourth or a diminished fifth. So, yeah, it's refers to an interval that has, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, six. Um, half steps uh, between it. So, um, yeah, can you explain more about and tell me? I have your, I have your. Um, What's, what are these things called? I'm not a teacher, so I forgot. What are these? They're not PowerPoints, but what are they called? Key notes. Key notes. Oh, sure. Yeah. There's, I don't know. Slides. <laughs> oh, you are slides. Okay. <laughs> okay, slides. <laughs> That's fine. Um, All I know is that I it like them opened... in PowerPoint, so oh, yeah. Okay. I'm not oh, okay. Oh, I have sure. them back. It oh. could have just opened, yeah, differently. I think that's from, what it is. Yeah. From me to you. Okay. Yeah. My Mac opened it in Keynote and I was like, okay, cool. Keynote. No, um, that's fine. Whatever okay. works. Um, yeah. So, you can all, you tell me if you want me to ascend, you know, go forward a page or, or, or whatever. And I also have examples from the book of Boba Fett, if you think it's relevant to bring that in at okay. some point. Um, yeah. Well, I think uh, if you want to go actually to the last one, we can take them out of order since we were kind of talking about those individual elements that happen within this theme. Oh, hold on. Back up one. This one. Yeah, that one. Oh, okay. Um, cool. Because it shows kind of those three pieces that I heard. Um and the fourth piece that you could add in would be that DSE Ray yeah. little idea. Like that's the one that doesn't show up in the Gorenson. Yeah. Um, but you get that minor second, the lower neighbor idea. And then um, I have that mm. as the kind of first one. Yep, there. Um, and then a minor third ascending by step. So that one specifically is going um, a whole step and then a half step that middle measure wait i'm hearing a so just ascending um so oh, like that's a, a phone oh my god i was like hearing that's a vibration of a phone oh, is it? <laughs> i was Sorry like about that <laughs> no because it sounded like the relate in the notes that were kind of t- oh my gosh okay <laughs> so okay i'm focusing now okay so we have the um this is what you're calling the lower neighbor right the lower neighbor idea yep yeah, okay. And then the second measure is our little ascend by step idea. Mm-hmm. Yep. And then if you wanted to put in the DSE ray, you get the little DSE ray idea that I don't have notated here. <laughs> exactly. And then you get the tritone, that six half step interval that we see in the third measure here. Yeah. Okay. And I see that you have them color coded and they have, yeah. Okay. M2 lower neighbor, M3 ascending by step. And you mean they're ascending by step and the total number of steps is like a minor third or the total yes. distance is a yeah. minor third. That was my idea with like M the, the little M2 is a uh, minor second. So like that's a little half step mm-hmm. or the little M3 minor third, like our total distance that we're going is three half steps, but we're getting there through whole step, half step. Great. Okay, cool. Yeah. 
I'm excited to get to that page. <laughs> All right. <laughs> we can go straight there if you want. Like, that's perfectly fine. Now that we've talked about this, we can okay. look at that Great. and consider. Um, <laughs> the only other little thing that I had was uh, the um, shout out to the Clone Wars. Like, I just feel oh, like okay. it should be recognized that uh, Kevin Kiner did do a okay. young Boba Fett theme. Um, it at least for me, uh, there's no like aural connection between um, that theme and any of the others, Williams or yeah. Orenson's themes. Um, but I just wanted to mention like it's there annotated <laughs> for you. Like you get this little yeah. this little idea that happens that comes up a lot in, in Clone Wars. Well, not so, a lot, but a handful see. of times. This Remember that is the one Boba Fett having a theme in the Clone Wars. I need to re. I guess I need to rewatch that. Um, yeah. It doesn't happen often, but there are a few instances where uh, you hear that, and uh, in scenes with with a young Boba Fett, nice plotting his revenge. Yeah, I like that. Um, cool. Okay, so let's go down to <laughs> this fun page. Um, okay. Yeah, and perhaps let's look at just the Williams first, since we've been talking about that. Just Okay. Um, and then maybe everyone, so that, I don't know, we can, so you can ex, uh, get people who are watching a chance to see the visual and, um, oops, um, oh my goodness, make sense of these, uh, this shorthand that you have, um, the annotations is what I'm trying to think, say. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, are they, I thought there were brackets above the score maybe there's only the one maybe i deleted them off it's possible but that it's okay it's if they poss- didn't transfer that's fine we'll <laughs> okay. go with what we have here so okay. i was just looking and i'm like there's one red bracket and like oh, all of the other color coding went away oh wow I'm, um i'm gonna chalk it up to a mac a pc to mac translation Probably. That's probably exactly what happened. Um, But in your mind, imagine that there's like green since we were color coding our little lower neighbor idea with green and then um, and then red and then green and then red across the top of here. So I have the little lower neighbor idea or down a half step and back up a half step um, as that first measure. and because it repeats, that can be your back up a half step, or when it goes on to the next idea, it still goes back up that half step. So I've got kind of the plus one, minus one, plus two, minus two. If you want to follow that line of annotation, that's just telling you uh, minus for down and plus for up, and the number is the number of half steps. So maybe you go down a half step, up as half step, um, or you go that minor third idea filling in that minor third through ascending steps. That was our plus two, plus one. And it looks like all of those shifted a little bit too, but you get the idea of being from C sharp to D sharp and D sharp to E. Um, And then we have kind of a lower neighbor again. The lower neighbor comes back in the little DS E-ray idea. Um, And then like maybe it's going to do that kind of ascending minor third thing again from C sharp to D sharp and maybe it's going to go to E, but that's where we get like surprise, you don't get E like you might expect um, or like you got the first time that you heard C sharp to D sharp. But instead, it's kind of this surprise tritone where you're not necessarily expecting or at least if you're basing it on what you've heard before. And last time you heard C sharp, D sharp, it went to E, then maybe you're not expecting to hear A in that context mm-hmm. for that tritone at the end. Yeah. So you're saying, okay, starting, I'm going to start playing from the beginning of it. Well, no, I'll make it a little after lower. Repeat. Up two half steps. Up one half step. D, S, E, or A. And you're saying one might expect you'd go here to the E, but instead right. you're going in the TT exclamation point, tritone. Right, tritone, yeah. right? Yeah. There it is. Um, so we have kind of these little parts, and then um, I think those parts translate really nicely to uh, Gorenson, well, one part of Gorenson's theme for uh, the Book of Boba Fett. Yeah, let me 
let me play some of this so okay. that people can remember the book of Boba Fett. Absolutely. Are, okay. I believe you can hear this theme in one minute into The Stranger. Um, well, first, let me just say, this isn't the main Boba Fett, Fett. Like, this isn't the one that was the single, right? The, the, um, so it is from that as well. It's not okay. the very first thing that you hear, um, but if you take like the main title track, the Book of Boba Fett, um, there are basically like five or more. I at least pulled out five different possible themes within that. Um, so they're kind of shorter sections where you hear like the first section and then you hear a like second section after that. Um, and it's that kind of second section there. And then you get more of the vocals that come in and do kind of three different parts. Um, oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. So what, it does, okay. it mm. does happen in that track as well. Um, but then it shows up a lot throughout the show. So this one is quoted um, a whole lot throughout the show, more than any of the other kind of parts of the main theme. Yeah. Okay. just going to repeat it. This is from that first episode. I can already hear many similarities. Yeah, it um it really st stood out once I started comparing the two. I was like, "Wow." You have the same little half-step idea of down half-step, up half-step, that lower neighbor figure. Um, now, rhythmically, obviously, it's very different. Uh, the instrumentation is very different. Um, we have voice. It's still low voice, but not nearly as low as our contrabassoon that we heard earlier. Um, so we have that low voice uh, on the half-step lower neighbor idea. And then that idea of kind of rising through a minor third, uh, we get that again, that up a, up a whole step, up a half step. Uh, and then what we seemingly don't get, and it's not super clear in this uh, recording either, is the tritone. Um, but we get that in that opening title track where it plays in that, uh, because you have the hey shouts um or later on they're the translated they're right so they're hilarious. translated to the fet shouts right um yes. <laughs> so we get our little cheesy you know boba <laughs> fet and we get all of those um exclamations of hey or <laughs> fet and that hey shout lines up with that arrival where i had kind of the little vertical note of a tritone um so you get a tritone between uh, a lower and higher note, so happening harmonically rather than melodically between two adjacent pitches. Um, so okay. that's like hidden in there. Okay, I'm going to now play from the main Boba Fett theme. Okay. Um, I, 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 I'm guessing most listeners probably watched that show, but I'm, I don't think everyone probably did. Um, okay, so this is the main theme by Ludwig Gorenson from the book of Boba Fett. So the section that you're talking about, it does come up later in this track, right? 
I'm it does. Sure it does. Yeah. Yeah. We're just going to do a little bit of skipping. Yeah. It goes after. No, yeah. After, after this. Yep. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Here we go. Oh, let me go a little bit back. It's, yeah, it's instrumental <laughs> first and then it repeats and the voice comes in with it. Yes, it certainly does. <laughs> here we go. That's that uh, tritone the first time around. Oh, wait. Where's the tritone? Um, the, so the first time they hayed with it uh, in the instrumental part. Okay. If you go back, I believe. Go back a little more? No. Yeah, against the hay. So it kind of creates oh. there or against or against the pedal. So if you're listening, there's like a really low do happening all the way through. And if you take the um, arrival oh. note, yeah. So you can kind of go either way, either like against the hay or against the pedal duh, um, that you hear below. So you get essentially a vertical tritone instead of a horizontal tritone. I get what you're saying. Okay. Cause it's not like the melody doesn't it's, uh, itself go like, like in the, right. like in the John Williams one, but it's, right. I get it. It's a vertical tritone, meaning it's against like, it's popping up more harm harmonically. Harmonically. Um, yeah. So against the bass, like if you listen to what's going on in the bass and you take totally. the, the hay shout, like both of those are an octave with each other. And then um, the main melody pitch against those is what's creating that tritone. Okay, yeah. So okay. it's kind of hidden. It's yeah. like the third element is hidden. So you have like, oh, it does the lower neighbor thing. It does the little da 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 thing that we would expect going up that minor third with a whole step and a half step. But then when da arrives, it's against that um, that bass note that creates the tritone. Yeah. Okay. I get it. Thanks for ex thanks for explaining that. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'm mapping out. Okay. Let's. The map. Okay. So here we have the yeah. minus one. Um, yeah. Minus one. Here plus we one. have the plus one. Here. Do. Uh -huh. In the in the Gorenson. Is this sort of? Uh, oh, I guess you have a different annotated page. Um, I opened it in a different app so I could annotate it. <laughs> um, oh no, that's fine. Um, Maybe. Yeah, here, I think uh -huh, this is there it. You yeah. Go. yeah. Um, oh, yeah, okay, like a minor third. Yeah, so, okay, the minus one, the plus one. Yep. Um, and then the difference is uh, one's annotated with a repeat sign, and the other one has, okay, like, yeah, the yeah. literal repeat of minus one plus one yep. rather than the repeat sign. So this goes, oops, yep. this goes here. And then we have this, oh, interesting. The plus two and huh. the plus one. Like, it's all there as far as what direction, like how many half steps up or down you're moving, uh, the pitch contour stays exactly the same for the first several notes. I never would have expected that. <laughs> I wouldn't either, that's such but an interesting hey, music theory, there you go. <laughs> that's such a funny, like, co I don't know, a coincidence or, or whatever I, it is yeah, that happened. Yeah, I don't know. Um, yeah. And then, yeah, you hear, you can't see the tritone in the same way because like, uh, it's horizontal. Oh, wait. Did you notate the tritone? Is this the tritone notated? It is. No, G. Yeah, 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 it's see. a G all the way up yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. So if you, G if you brought it down an octave, yeah. it would be easier to see. But yeah. yeah. Oh, my gosh. Wow. That's cool. Yeah. That is unexpected. Okay. So do you think, what do you think, like, do you think it, that was on purpose? Futile question usually. But yeah, um, without a conversation with Ludwig, uh, I have no idea uh, if it was intentional or not. Um, it's definitely not something that he's mentioned in, in interviews that I've heard. Um, but I do think that he probably went back and listened to like, what does Boba Fett sound like in the original Star Wars trilogy? Um, so it's whether it was a like conscious decision or not, he certainly would have like heard 
the original theme and then come up with his theme. Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't know. That's interesting because the Gorenson, the Gorenson theme for me feels like very firmly, it feels much more tonally centered, obviously, Mm -hmm. like, you know, it's fortified by the shouts and by the pedal, um, and everything. So even if the lead top line, I don't know what, what what to call it, the, the, the melody, um, Mm -hmm. is doing the same notes, it, it still comes out sounding so different because the context, the harmonic context, um, that's, I guess, some, a way that composers sometimes like hide their references, sort of like make them like Easter eggs for themselves and for people yeah. like like you. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, so, you know, maybe, maybe it was an intentional hidden reference and uh, maybe it wasn't, and there's not really a great way for us to know either way. So here's another question. Do you think there is something intrinsic about, let's say that it is a coincidence and that Gorenson wasn't um, basing it off of Williams' theme at all. Do you think there's something about Boba Fett as a character or about characters like Boba Fett that might inspire composers to come up with something like that? Something with, you know, small stepwise movement, something with a tritone? Yeah, uh, perhaps. I think, um, I think there's something mysterious and unknown about Boba Fett's character. And that's like the big draw of, of Boba Fett as a character um, is that kind of mystique and this like, he's this character we want to know more about. And um, maybe the book of Boba Fett was what you wanted it to be. And maybe it wasn't because you liked the mystique of mm. this kind of unknown masked character. Um, but having that, character and kind of this uh, distance from the character, not sure who he is. He's some sort of, uh, well, I guess maybe it's debatable if he's a bad guy or not, but he's initially like, right, he's like on the side of the empire. So I suppose he's a bad guy and a bounty hunter. Um, And you have that like, oh, let's put his theme in a lower register and use those half steps and have it have kind of that more um, dark, mysterious feel by doing that. Or maybe the tritone as well, having that kind of like unknown element to it. Uh, it's a, a dissonant interval, but also like the, um, it's the maximum distance you can go. Like it's exactly splitting an octave in half. Mm -hmm. So it's basically the maximum distance you can go before you really start getting closer back to the note that you started on. Yeah. Um, So it's that idea of, um, and it's often used in that kind of idea of conveying space as like a a near and far or kind of conveying some sort of, of distance. So maybe it's our distance from this character or something kind of unknown or unsettling about him. Um, that throws the tritone in there. Yeah, Perhaps. I can see that. Yeah, I don't, I, I don't know exactly. That's just kind of off the top of my head. Uh, right, of course. The, yeah. These are just sort of speculations, but I always, yeah. I do like to, be in when one just listens to a lot of um, film and TV music and video game music, one comes across a lot of things that kind of, sound really similar. And Mm -hmm. a lot of the time it's pretty obvious that it's not, that it probably wasn't a direct reference. It's probably just like the nature of this type of character is going to, is usually portrayed in a way that is sort of like this. Um, Mm -hmm. with, uh, the lower, with the half step, um, with the descending, you know, the lower neighbor half step thing. I am also thinking of Jaws. (laughs) Um, absolutely. Which, uh, so at least within the Williams canon, uh, that that is perhaps a sort of similar, a really low pitched, like descending half step. Um, And um, the Gorenson version, it it goes immediately back up. It goes, or Mm -hmm. yeah, it goes, so it doesn't go like, it it sort of like makes it into its own, 
it's it's funny because it then it there really are like we mapped it like it lines up it does line it up does. <laughs> <laughs> but the with the rhythms um changed it's the line is comes off totally different mm-hmm. um because the pause points are in different places it's not in williams's version the pause place is after descending mm-hmm. you're going down and then you kind of rest there for a second um and then in the book of boba fett it's goes immediately back up um yeah it's fascinating uh i someone, think it's interesting too that like the um oh sorry what were you saying oh no no please okay um i was just going to say that like the break point is the dsc ray because for like williams um williams doesn't accidentally put ds rays in his music um it's like a very intentional decision um so which someone might argue with me on that so like maybe maybe some of them happen by accident but um he's very aware of using uh, that motive and its representation of of death and of darkness and kind of how that's used. So I think it's definitely intentional that Williams is using a DSE ray in Boba Fett's theme. Um, but I think it's interesting that if Gorenson, let's like hypothesize that Gorenson knows that he's doing this one-to-one interval correlation between his theme and Williams. Mm-hmm. And if he was aware of that, then like the decision to break that off and do something a little different happens right where you would get that DSE ray. So like that's the part that gets left out as Boba Fett is reinterpreted for the Disney Plus show, um, yeah. which I think is interesting. Yeah, because when we first meet Boba Fett in The Empire Strikes Back, his presence does um, signify some sort of impending <laughs> doom for our heroes. So right. it's almost like the DSERA is like we are meeting Boba Fett on a bad foot uh, here. Um, right. And I guess the Gorenson version is perhaps saying like, we met him on a bad foot before. He doesn't mean doom anymore. So let's take that back. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's not always death. Just yeah. sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, that's interesting. Um Dan Golding, who is a frequent guest of this show and host of Art of the Score, um, a podcast that is excellent and people should listen to their Empire Strikes Back, Empire Strikes Back episodes. But he asked, um, he, is Boba Fett the only villain in the saga films to have a theme predominantly associated with solely woodwinds? Mm. I guess that's an open question for any, anyone listening. Um, it is, I personally, uh, think of the Imperials motif as being a woodwind motif. However, I do think there is like a sort of almost inherent softness to Boba's theme, uh, to it being on the woodwinds, especially on like these reeds, these reeded, um, Woodwinds. I don't know. There's like a soft um, timbre. I guess it's not that soft, be, you know, when it's contrabassoon, <laughs> but right. there, it, it's certainly not like it doesn't cut through like a trombone or something. Yeah. 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 That's really interesting. I hadn't really thought about it in comparison um, that way to other themes and the instrumentation as being unique in that way. But I suppose Perhaps. it's. Yeah, maybe it is. <laughs> Perhaps the <laughs> woodwind instrumentation was a, a hint all the way back in 1980 that there might be more to Boba, Boba Fett than just a villain. Uh, yeah. It sort of wasn't maybe committing to full villainy, just sort of soft, wrong place, wrong time, part of the system villainy. But I don't with know. With the DSC array. <laughs> with so. the DSC array. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. I'm really trying here. Um, yeah. Um, I don't know. I think he's, um, maybe it was, maybe it was that like, he's a redeemable character. Mm. Um, yeah. That's a good so. way to put it. Yeah. yeah. So the hints were there all along. Um, <laughs> something else that I want to, well, I want to know if I'm the only 
person who kind of thinks of this. Um, I feel like Boba Fett's theme, I see it as being related to the Cloud City, to one of the Cloud City themes, particularly um, this one. I'll play it, but I'll show, I'll show everyone the, how it's notated in Frank Lehman's catalog. Um, the Cloud City 2, Best Trouble in Bespin theme. Um, in my sort of headcanon, the Boba Fett theme, the Cloud City 2 theme, and the Imperials motif are um, cut from the same cloth. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure you can, you can see why. Uh, you know, we have this sextuplet. We have this sort of, um, just on paper, if I were looking really, really uh, quickly, I, I might mix them up. Um, and I will play that theme so people can remember what I'm referring to. Here we go. That's one of my favorite spots. Um, but yeah. Now it's, it's not the same thing as staying on the same note and then going down, but um, the, the front loaded um, quick, succession notes um have a similar vibe to them yeah and you've got the little half step like mm -hmm. lower neighbor idea coming back to the same note um yeah but like you said kind of with the other two versions of the boba fett theme is it like are you staying on the lower note or are you coming back up to the original note like which is going to be the long duration note that you're pausing on totally and and in in this cloud city one it it stays on the higher note, so it only flirts with the lower note. Whereas in Boba Fett, it, it does linger on the lower note. So mm -hmm. interesting. Mm -hmm. um, okay, well, <laughs> let's see. Was is there any of anything else that um, that we have failed to talk about with regard to Boba Fett's theme at this point? I don't think so. I think that's uh, everything I had made note of. It's, um, it's so cool that you got to present this um, at, the, at the John Williams uh, conference. Um, I wish I could it have was, been there. <laughs> it was amazing. It was by far the best conference um, I have ever attended. And so many amazing scholars and just like-minded people all in the same room uh, sharing their research on on John Williams scores. So it was really, really amazing. Yeah, that's extremely amazing. Um, there have been several guests this season who were at that conference and I've only heard uh -huh. uh, very good things about it. Yeah. Yeah. The hope is that like they do something else like this, like maybe every five, 10 years or something, we oh, I hope do so. another one and we all get back together because it would be really great. <laughs> yeah. Um, hopefully he can come to the, John Williams can come to the next one. That would be nice. Yeah. yeah. Would be great. Yeah. Um, okay. So we'll continue where we left off. And okay. this. Sir, we have a priority right. signal from the Star Destroyer Avenger. Right. It's there so will be a soft. a substantial reward for the one who finds the I'll talk over it. Falcon. You are free to use. So, in a few seconds, we're going to hear Boba Fett's voice, and it's changed to Tamara Morrison's voice. As you wish. There we go. My lord, we have. To... Oh, thank goodness we're coming out of the asteroid field. That was the attacking a star destroyer um, motif that we just heard. Um, and let's see. This attacking a star destroyer. Well, attacking a star destroyer is the name of the is both the name of the queue and the motif. And while I'm while I'm while I have his catalog open, let me just put that in on screen so people can can see what that looks like. Um, it's the last season of the show that I did was Solo, so Solo was Star Wars story, um, and the part of music that we're in at the moment was definitely like interpolated into that film. Um, and there'll be a couple parts that I'll, that I'll mention. Um, so yeah, it's the, or what? Um, that thing on, 
in the brass. Um, he writes, the Franklin Man writes, I, I really like how he writes descriptions for, the, for these motifs. Thrilling brass motif and surrounding passages used once in Empire Strikes Back and revived with modification in Powell's solo in Reminiscence Therapy. Suggested in Adventures of Han, Arrangement, etc. Um, okay, so I'll just, I'll just keep that there while we continue to listen. And feel free to interrupt me at any time if you hear something that you want to point out. Okay. All right. Oh, and this thing that the dee 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 is also um, cascading trumpet lines. Let's get out of here. Ready for light speed? <laughs> okay, there's already another thing. It relates to solo with Star Wars story. Um, okay, so I'm going to point it out while it plays. This. Okay, it's like <laughs> that's such a poor representation of what it of what it sounds like. <laughs> uh, okay, let me play it in the track without the um, without the dialogue. I'm talking about this these this woodwind. That this. Okay. When I play the part from Solo, A Star Wars Story, I think you'll know what I'm, what I'm referring to. Um, I didn't notice it when I was, I don't think I noticed this when I was doing my coverage on Solo. This happened during um, minutes 86 through 90. Um, so if I go to the track, let's see, I have it all right. Kessel Run in less than 12 parsecs. Okay. Um, and it shows up about 30 seconds into it. Okay. Here we go. It's it's okay. It's gonna come out of a solo theme, but you'll hear. Okay. Here. Yeah, just a little orchestrational little um, Easter egg that uh, John Powell put into Solo: A Star Wars Story. Um, I'm appreciating that score more and more. Um, yeah. So I want to give John Powell props for that, uh, for that one. All right. Absolutely. So there was, there yeah. was a little something, um, which I'm not usually one to take like two notes and say like, Oh, I think that could be a reference to this because to me, that's like, it could be anything, you know, mm -hmm. once you start chopping it down into little tiny bits. Um, but there's like a repeated A. It's at, I think, like 138 or 139 in the track that you sent to me, mm -hmm. um, where it's the, uh, you see the Star Destroyer again, and you just get like a two repeated notes that to me, like, could continue into Imperial March. It doesn't. Oh. But like, I think if I heard it on its own and it wasn't coupled with the visual of seeing the Star Destroyer again, I wouldn't have even thought that. But then, I don't know, that like little moment where you see the Star Destroyer again and like you have just a minute ago seen the Star Destroyer and heard Imperial March and then like you see it again and you just hear bump, bump, and it doesn't continue into Imperial March, but like in my mind it wanted to. And that was something I hadn't noticed before. Oh, okay. Let's well, let's definitely listen to that. Oh, thank goodness we're coming out of the asteroid field. Just oh, you that. that there? Yeah. Do, do. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, I can see that. It was, like it could have done that. It could have. Yeah, it could have. It didn't, and I wouldn't have thought it if there wasn't a Star Destroyer on the screen when those two notes were happening. And then those two things together made my brain go... Oh, that was an Imperial March reference. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, the the context of the visuals are so important to consider. Um, it's almost like everything is moving so fast at this point where that you can slip in a hint of something and then, you know, you're lurching to a different direction. The scene is cutting to something else. Um, <laughs> That's cool. I didn't have the same association, but now that you pointed out, I'm like, I, I can see why you would. Yeah, um, how it would go that way. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's funny. Um, okay, so I guess I'll continue. Let's get out of here. Ready for light speed? One, two, 
Just the engine sound. I love that sound. <laughs> Me too. I love that. He, he's like one, two, three, and then it's sort of like, well, are we are we waiting for something? Um, yeah, yeah. And it feels to me like it comes like right out of the score, like what you're hearing, and then that sound effect of like you hear the the engine kind of coming down and and not doing so well, yeah. um, and you hear that as like for me starting up around I think an E is where it starts, and it just kind of like feels like it's like a descending scale that just came right out of what the music was doing ahead of time. Oh, you're saying the engine, like you hear yeah, the engine like sort the of descend engine sound pitch. like melds with oh. what's going on for me. Like it starts as music and then it's like halfway through the engine noise that I'm like, oh no, we've trans transitioned and like this isn't score anymore. That's the engine sound. And it feels like it just kind of like falls in a scale out of what's going on musically to me. Oh, I love that. I want to hear that again now. Um, so I can experience that too. One, yeah. Two, three. Ah. It's not fair. Christmas, look, it's our work. It's not my fault. Yeah, I, I, I feel that. Yeah. Yeah. It's hard to describe exactly other than like it just, it has that sound of like, it's a very musical sound. Like, I think like the, I, the last note, the last clear note I think I heard was a D sharp, mm -hmm. I think. And um, the way that it, it's not like a, it is kind of difficult to hear the ending of that note. Right. Because I think I, I feel like I hear, dee, dee, like after that. Dee, dee. Yeah. And it I don't, feels like it starts there. Like the engine also starts on that D sharp and then just kind of goes down. And at some point, I don't know, does it stop being musical and start being sound effect? Or does it just kind of like stay both? Yeah, I'm, I'm not even, it's either really, I honestly can't tell if that part is the, is engine or score. Um, yeah, <laughs> me either. <laughs> <laughs> no. um, well, now, okay, wait, let's listen to it in the track without the engine sound. Um, okay. Okay. Uh, this will be the moment of truth. Okay. Obviously. A little early. Okay, I'm going to skip forward a little bit. It's here. Oh. Okay, that thing that I was hearing was sound effect. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think it definitely was. Because wow. you have that like D sharp that you hit up there and you go, okay. Yeah. But then the engine just does this little D. descending scale like yeah. from that D sharp that it's really hard to tease those two apart as like what was actually the music and what was the sound effect. They really merged together really well there. Totally. That is cool. Yeah. I, I would have thought that was perhaps the score, but then the only thing that would make me think it wasn't the score is that it was so quiet, in which case I was mm -hmm. like, I guess it was like pianissim pianissimo. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, but no. Okay. Cool. Cool. Um, all right. So now we are continuing. Um, they are, well, their odds are not going to be so great according to 3PO. But unfortunately. The odds of surviving a direct assault on an Imperial star just Shut up! <laughs> Movie twit. That I feel okay, I skipped forward a little bit more, but um that part reminds me of Carmina Barana. <laughs> I had made that note. Oh, I had really? like, okay. this feels like, yeah, I have that in here. I'm like, <laughs> Carmina Barana, question mark, is exactly what my notes say at that moment. <laughs> That's funny. Um, yeah, like, well, it's not my fault. No light speed. This part. <laughs> 
and it's in the same key as well, in case anyone <laughs> out there was wondering. Um, it is in the same key, and it very much feels like um, O Fortuna is kind of happening right there in in this context. Yeah. Um, if you're not sure if you know that piece, you do know that piece. You've probably heard it in a lot of commercials <laughs> and stuff. Um, um, okay, we're having a D... We are getting, or no, we're not quite there yet. We're approaching a DS theory moment, though. Mm -hmm. um. Sir, we just lost the main rear deflector shield. One more direct hit on the back quarter, and we're done for. Turn her around. Uh, I said, turn her around. I'm going to put all power on the front shield. You're going to attack them? Sir, the odds of surviving a direct assault on an Imperial. Oh my gosh, it's so stressful. I love how there it's like every it becomes even more like caustic there or I don't mm -hmm. know like um when the brass all come in or when the trumpets all come in together it's uh, I don't know it feels sort of like this is the last this is the last resort or like this is the last thing we can try or something it feels very moment of like moment of truth moment of you know putting it all out there giving your best shot um, the accents and, and everything and the percussion give it like a, almost like a splashy, um, splashy feeling as well. Um, okay. Moving to attack position. Shields up. Dia Sire. Was that one of the ones you noted? It was, yeah. I have that little da 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 dum yeah. as a DS ray happening a couple times. And we get like before that a little bit, it's like almost, it's been like flirting with. I think all of the like um Carmina Barana kind of referential kind of sounding stuff is like flirting with DS ray, but it's not quite there yet mm. you'll get like a couple notes of it but it's like not quite fully there and then like you finally get the da 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 dum and you're like oh there it is there's the f finally the full dse right yeah i see what you mean because especially like rhythmically it it's um it's so the do, 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 like it's kind of yeah. doing things within the ballpark of you know, right? Like if it were on random or something, you would think at some point it's going to hit a DSRA, but it's yeah. kind of dancing around <laughs> it. Um, yeah, and then the payoff is when the DSRA happens, um, which again, it's another example of context being sort of important when coming up with spe uh, claims that might otherwise be completely spur spurious. Um, like the DSRA does feel like there are multiple ways it is potentially being set up. Um, yeah. And plus, uh, in the, in context, this is, you know, they're moving to attack position, uh, track them. They may come around for another pass. Um, they're in a very dire situation. Yeah. Track them. They may come around for another pass. Captain Nida, the ship no longer appears on our scopes. They can't have disappeared. No ship that small has a cloaking device. Well, there's no trace of them, sir. Captain, Lord Vader demands an update on the pursuit. Get a shuttle ready. I shall assume... And the way the music chills out there is so... Mm -hmm. um, I don't know, it represents the fact that they can't track, like they can't see them um, really well. Yeah, I, I thought so too. And I, um, I probably really like that cue just because... Uh, I'm a harpist. So for oh. me, like, like I hear harp come into the score and I go like, Ooh, you know, this is, this is a big moment. And there was, um, oh, I was surprised like, there was, there was so much harp in these five minutes. Like at the start, you already mentioned a little harp idea mm -hmm. and then we get harp here and then we go, um, back to Dagobah and we get a little bit like more harp there. Um, so it was interesting to me because I think, in isolation with these five minutes, I would have put harp like with the Dagobah scenes, but not with the battle scenes. Uh -huh. um, so I think it is really interesting that we have the harp like re-enter the texture in the middle of a battle scene. And it is that like, we don't know. We don't know where they went. You know, we're kind of blind. And so we have this um, little harp flourish as a representation of 
of that and just how drastic a change it is from the like full attack mode uh, orchestration that we get. Yeah. The harp like adds like a touch of magic. It seems there. It's sort of like, mm-hmm. where are they? <laughs> uh, right. Um, you like to know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which is kind of how it's used on Dagobah as well. Like it, it is very mm-hmm. associated with, you know, the force and the force and stuff yeah. like that. Yeah. Um, but that's a good point. Like to have the harp show up in the middle of battle is is a little bit like there is going to be an element of harpiness to it. Like uh, the, either right. the force or like a magic trick or something. Mm-hmm. Um, even if it's, you know, just not the force, but it's like shields or whatever. But um, okay, let's listen. Let's listen to the harp in context. I can't have disappeared. No ship. I think there might be one little thingy before then as well. Shields up. Okay, DSC array. Track them. They may come round. Where are they? Captain Harp. The ship no longer appears on our scopes. They can't have disappeared. No ship that small has a cloaking device. Well, there's no trace of them, sir. Captain, Lord Vader demands an update on the pursuit. Okay, back to when you were saying that those two notes made you think (laughs) it was just two notes, but you were thinking you were finishing it with the Imperial March. Yes, I did it again here. (laughs) Okay. Wait, were you finishing it with the Imperial March? Yes. Oh, were you? Okay. No, no, I was <laughs> that first note. I was finishing it with Yoda's theme. <laughs> oh, okay, we're getting into like obvi- I'm not. You know, your mileage may vary, listeners. This is obviously I'm to f- complete the sentence when you just hear one note is like you could literally go anywhere because it's just anywhere. one note. <laughs> but in my head, the first time it it plays that note, I'm thinking. Um, no ship that small has a cloaking device. Dee, 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 dee. Okay. And then yeah. the second time? Well, there's no trace of them, sir. Captain, Lord Vader demands an update on the- I'm thinking... Dee, 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 dee. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's Which so I funny. Think, I don't know. Maybe that would be like a little more <laughs> fitting here. I feel like the harp context, maybe that is the Yoda reference. Mm-hmm. I think um, that may so, be priming my brain to think. Yeah, I think the harp, and you're like, oh, harp, we must be back on Dagobah. And Yoda like, or the Force. A, right, one or the other would be more suitable there. Um, <laughs> but no, like right after that, it goes down a little bit. It dips a little bit lower as well, and they're talking about like, you know, Vader will want to report, and and then that's that's where my brain auto-fills in of the... Uh, of could the, autofill again, Imperial yeah. March. Like if someone says something about Vader or if like there's a Star Destroyer on the screen, um, then it's definitely, I think, that visual priming to where you go like, oh yeah, I could yeah. fill that in. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Okay. Um, yeah, so the harp, the very um, specifically placed mm-hmm. ar- harp arpeggios, I guess one could call them. They're, they're like, you know, a three notes at a time, right? Three, mm-hmm. four. Um, yeah. And then we'll, we're going to hear harp even more in a bit. No ship that small has a cloaking device. Well, there's no trace of them, sir. Captain, Lord Vader demands an update on the pursuit. Get a shuttle ready. That dee, one. Dee, dee, dee. It's not another tritone. Dee, mm-hmm. dee. I shall assume full responsibility for losing them and apologize to Lord Vader. Meanwhile, continue to scan the area. Yes, Captain Deedon. Oh, man. The, the unison of those low notes. Um, something about it. My ear is drawn to them. Mm-hmm. Um, even though they're unraveling or unfolding so slowly. Um, and then when the harp comes in, it's sort of like a... A surprise. It, it just like the glissando. Um, yeah. Those are, that's the extent of my thoughts about that. It's just <laughs> okay. like, um, it, the mood changes so drastically, I feel like in 30 seconds where it's so, it, it, it's so stressful and quick and moving all over the place. And then when we switch to the Imperial side and they can't track the Falcon and we're hearing these like magical harp things, like what mystery is happening here? 
and then it just like goes to a dark, like a dark place. And then it, right now we're transitioning back to Yoda. Um, yeah. There's, I, there's just such a, a, an emotional um, range happening. For sure. When uh, I first watched and listened to these five minutes, um, I realized just how much is packed into five minutes of Star Wars. Yes. And I think like like the emotional range, um, the range of like the different instruments that are being used all throughout, like there's so much that's going on and you can hear like all of the different, even without the visuals, hearing all of the different action that's happening all the way through this passage and realizing like, wow, there is so much going on in just five minutes. Um, and then... I think that's like the power of then the whole movie, because then it's that way for a good portion of the film where you have that just one transition into the next and feeling like you're constantly a part of the action through the soundscape. Yeah. I think the soundscape helps so tremendously and it helps sort of, um, it helps us leave locations and then come back to them Mm -hmm. and without missing a beat. Like we've been on Dagobah for you know, a few weeks now in the podcast and, you know, cutting between Dagobah and other things, but then going back to Dagobah, it's like such a specific feeling and sound. It's so specific. Yes. Such a specific place. You can't miss it. Um, and then also we're just exiting, like at the beginning of this set of minutes, they were talking about, still talking about asteroid fields. And mm-hmm. the first time we get into the asteroid field is in minutes, it was in the episode that was the eighth episode. This is the fourteenth episode of this um, this season. So episode eight would have been minutes thirty six through forty. And now we're in thirty minutes later, and still like so much has happened, but also still this asteroid field has somehow occupied thirty minutes of the film. But it doesn't yeah. feel like uh, the I'm I've been really surprised by the pacing um, of things in a in a positive way. It's pretty incredible. Yeah. So many threads. Um, okay. So we're continuing on to the very specific Dagobah. Use the force. Yes. <laughs> now, Feel it. Oh, okay, we have to stop. There's That's so, it was much. so evocative. <laughs> There's so oh, much happening. Yeah. There is so much going on. Um, that uh, like string slide that we heard and like all of the microtones in between, um, just kind of listening to that little upward slide, like that's part that really stood out to me. Um, and for this whole section, I feel like the ups and downs, and they're very like directly connected to what's going on. Like lifting a rock, the music goes up. Setting the rock yeah. back down, the music goes back down. You know, the the X wing starts sinking, and you hear like an almost Mickey Mousey kind of wah, wah, yeah. Wah, wah. yeah yeah. <laughs> it- Okay, let's okay, let's go back because there's a lot. Meanwhile, continue okay. to scan the area. Yes, Captain Dita. Like already the 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 instruments that are playing that lead line, I mm-hmm. don't know. The oops. Um it sounds very steppy, like like this sounds like someone is training for something, right? But, and it's it could just be. It could. It could just be going. Dee, dee, dee. Like, but it's like. It's. Yeah. It's like ornamenting um, mm-hmm. the line a little bit and. Use the force. Yes. And just Yoda's theme being like. Uh, you know, a counter melody almost, or uh, it's, what are you, what are your thoughts about this? What else yeah, sticks I out to you? 
it's interesting that you mentioned it being like steppy and that being like the training, like Luke's trying to make these steps forward. And mm-hmm. I think you could think of it that way of kind of the steps like up the scale with what you just played. But the way that you mentioned, like each one is decorated yeah. and those decorations are lower. So maybe that's making this like climbing upward a struggle and you're kind of being like held back down each step. So they're kind of these like stutter steps are kind of struggling to step forward. Um Yeah, I like that a lot. Yeah, maybe like a a challenging climb to where it's eventually climbing to the next pitch up, but it's like stepping backwards first, stepping down in the scale before going up. So maybe that's kind of the the struggle that that Luke is feeling in the frustration of of this training, which we hear so much. I had never noticed like how prominent Luke's size were until you like (laughs) take the video away and he's like, oh. (laughs) (laughs) and yoda's size too Uh uh-huh yeah both of them yeah luke i feel like is still holding on to things Mm -hmm. um and when the like he's moving forward but always like looking behind him um Mm -hmm. you're like okay i mean i'll go in the cave but I will bring my weapon. Like I will do this, right. but like, like he hasn't fully let go. So it is sort of like something is holding him. Something is holding him back. Um, yeah. Um, let's continue. Whoa. Oh yeah. And R2's beeps uh, <laughs> feel very part of the soundtrack as well. They do. Yeah. Um, I think that was something I made a note of that was really interesting to me was like listening to the natural habitat here and the thought of like organic sounds versus non-organic sounds in what we hear here, because there's, I mean, we're, we're on Dagobah, we're, we're in a swamp. So there's like bird noises and frog noises and bug noises to just kind of like encapsulate what a swamp normally sounds like to us. Of course, they're like, space bugs and space frogs and space birds. So it's a little different from our like normal context. Um, But then there's also just like R2, who's sometimes it feels like it's a deliberate communication. And other times he's just kind of like muttering in the background, just kind of like making droid noises, but contributing more to the soundscape of the planet than he is to the conversation. Yeah, it's it's sort of like... um we're almost, we're experiencing R2. Okay. Droids, we usually experience in the context of how they are serving the people or, you know, Mm -hmm. whoever owns them. Um, but R2 seems, we get to see him make a lot of autonomous sort of R2 just being R2, not R2 directly talking to someone or directly doing something for someone. It feels like he is just, he's just expressing himself at this point, like he's, you know, I don't, yeah. I don't think he's telling, trying to tell Luke something specific, you know? Um, oh, R2. Yeah. I thought that was, that was really great to me to hear him be just kind of like part of the background sounds and that it wasn't, you know, sometimes he's like shouting out and trying to communicate what's going on. Um, but otherwise he just kind of blends into the background and becomes part of the scene um as though he was one of the one of the creatures living there like just kind of folds in with all of the other animal sounds that you hear in the background yeah and it's nice that luke doesn't get distracted by r2 like he can tell that r2 is not speaking to him or or he's used to r2 just being r2 or he's focusing so hard that he won't right. even notice if anyone other than Yoda. Um, but yeah, I think I think Luke's um, Luke ignoring R two at this point also helps set R two apart in this scene as something that is just part of the Dagobah um, ambiance. Um, yeah. This job. And there's the glissando you were talking about yeah. where the strings are like yeah, sliding up. Um, and 
and... Like we can hear in the woodwinds, we can hear in, you know, the different pockets of instruments. We can hear that things are falling. Right. Because the line is like falling. The musical line is yeah. falling. And then you get R2 like actually communicating. Like you yeah. can tell that's R2 being not just part of the background noise, but like, oh no. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um. And that's the musical womp womp. Right. <laughs> I mean, it's not like literally on the muted trumpet to have like the normal, you know, wah, wah, wah yeah. sound, but like it may as well be. So that to me was just a very like Mickey Mousey kind of moment in the film score um, where we get like this, oh no, the X-Wing is sinking. And then we hear our little, our little shout out to that. <laughs> right. <laughs> Yeah. Um it's Oh, okay, that dee 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 that R2 just did. I feel like Ender, if you're listening to this in the last episode, he was saying that he recognizes um some of R2's phrases that R2 says over and over again. I'm I'm curious mm-hmm. if this was if you would consider this to be one of them, Ender, if you're listening. Um because it does stand out to me as Oh, R two's doing that dee, 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 um, thing. <laughs> and that's certainly out now. So certain are you. Anything uh, before we just continue moving on? Um, I didn't have, I think, anything other than just that kind of question of which of our two sounds in this passage are like communication and which are just, you know, kind of him chattering in the background. Cause I feel like this is, to me, this was the most ambiguous part was like, he does his little like, Oh no. And we hear a couple phrases that like, like you just mentioned, like sound very much like things that R2 would say. Um, and then yeah. you just kind of have like, Whoa, in the background. And like, is that still, R2's commentary on things, or is he just being R2 in the background? Hmm. Good question. Yeah. Rhetorical. Oh, yeah, rhetorical. You what cannot be done. <laughs> Do you nothing that I say? Master, moving stones around is one Here, thing. Here, I feel like he's peanut gallery. Totally different. Mm-hmm. No. No different. Only different in your mind. You must unlearn what you have learned. All right, I'll give it a try. No, try not. Do. Or do not. There is no try. So for the next 20 seconds, there will be no dialogue. This is the beginning of Yoda Raises the Ship. That's like... We're hearing something rise, clearly. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, and that's the end of these minutes. But obviously we know what happens is Luke, you know, tries to raise the ship, fails for a little bit. Um, right. But do you have any um, do you have any thoughts about like the beginning of this of this next queue or the end of the previous queue? Um, I think for me, listening that, that scale is like what really stands out, having that ascending scale and the ascending ship kind of go, uh, with it. Um, and just feeling, even though the scale is not like entirely unfamiliar, Mm -hmm. um, it has like a feeling, I think of like, um, a, I don't know how to exactly put it, but like a a less familiar feeling with the kind of like string tremolo that's going on on Mm. on each note and um, kind of the shimmery quality to it. Um, And it could be like what we hear just before or where we end on the scale. Um, 
so like I think you can hear it maybe two ways. Maybe you hear it as a scale that like starts on an E flat and like goes up to a D and doesn't go to the final E flat. Mm -hmm. Um, Or maybe you hear it as like starting the note before that on like D, um, in which case uh, for those of you that are, that are music theorists out there, um, like a D Locrian scale, maybe um, thinking in modes, um, but either way, hearing it as somehow like unresolved even mm-hmm. though it's all like steps up within a scale, it still has this like tense, unresolved feeling to me. It it okay. It, I I really hear what you're um what you're saying. I'm gonna um I'm gonna now play this from the track without the dialogue and everything. Let's see. Okay. I'm timing this in the right spot. Oh wait, I believe this would be in the Yoda and the Forest. The soundtrack is like a whole thing. Oh. So a couple things. Um, the strings are playing in seconds. So mm-hmm. it's also like two scales almost. And I believe they're all the planing. Time. Yeah, I think they're all parallel mm-hmm. seconds, I think. Um, so we have one line going like. Wait, let's see. Yeah. But in tremolo. And then we have another starting. But imagine those happening at the same time. So it's it it's it's like complicated in a little bit. But it doesn't <laughs> sound wholly dissonant because I feel like a major second no. is not dissonant to me. Um, I mean, or I mean a minor. Technically, technically. Is, but yeah, yeah, I guess, I guess fine. technically, but it's, but it's, but what sounds dissonant to you is what sounds dissonant to you. And yeah, yeah I can yeah. tolerate much more dissonance than the average yeah, person. Same, same. <laughs> so it's like, so I, I, okay. It is a little bit dissonant. I, like, a, but I think maybe also something about the, the timbre of the shimmeriness or whatever. There's, yeah. I think there's more room for that kind of technical dissonance when right. the texture is so just like the shimmer because when things shimmer you know it's like maybe you wouldn't normally match you know wear something like red and like hot pink in the same outfit but if you if something were shimmering and the light was sort of you yeah. know making the shade kind of slightly different uh, that wouldn't really register as something like dissonant colors or whatever um yeah. i think that's sort of this. So it's like very, the color, it's colors. Uh, yeah. And I think the tremolo helps too, because like you already hear the note as moving, even though like it's, it's staying on the same pitch, it's not shifting between pitches, but like still hearing that as like the notes already moving. So you notice the interaction with the other pitch that creates that dissonance less. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And, and I think that is that kind of shimmering quality to it to where like it seems more okay that you have these two scales moving side by side and they're like both doing something that on its own would be very consonant and familiar but then when you put them together it gives it this um otherworldly kind of quality to it yeah um it's the whole um the whole yoda and the forest the whole this whole all of Yoda's music here is, um, I wish I could write music that were this like genuinely magical sounding without sounding cheesy. Like mm. I just feel like it's yeah. so earnest and so, <laughs> so well done. <laughs> uh, um, yeah. Okay. Well, we're at the end of the minutes and it, it's, it was such good Star Wars. It was. Um, let's see, we started with the end of the magic tree with Luke chopping Vader's head off with the timpani, bum, bum, bum. Um, we heard that creepy Luke's theme. Um, we talked about the Imperial Star Destroyer, uh, the attack position stuff. Um, let's see, the magic entering the battle, 
the DSC array, um, and then the the Dagobah womp womp womps, and the magical moments, uh, and R2 and everything, so much. And Boba Fett's theme. Oh my gosh. Yeah. We definitely <laughs> talked about Boba Fett's theme. Um, yeah. I somehow missed that whole thing. Uh, yeah. That's funny. Um, cool. Uh, do you have any final thoughts about these minutes before we move on to the Star Wars Music Minute questionnaire? No, just thank you again for having me. And it was so much fun to listen to Star Wars in a new way that I really hadn't before, taking just uh, moment by moment approach. Um, and I feel like I need to do this more often because I heard so much that no matter how many times I see the films or listen to the score, um, I just hadn't noticed. And all of those things just kind of come out to the forefront. So yeah, thank you amazing for challenging me happen. to listen. Oh, you're so welcome. And thank mm-hmm. you so much for coming on the show. You, um, you were, well, you were a recommendation from Jennifer Harding, who was on the show earlier this season. And so, yeah. Um, yeah. Wonderful. We did our uh, PhD together at Florida State. So we were there for the same four years. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I love Jen. Um, all right. So Star Wars Music Minute Questionnaire. Uh, this is your first time and it's the same it three questions that I ask every guest. And okay. um, so, yeah. First question is, in exactly three words, what does Star Wars sound like? So do I just say the words or do I get to expound on those words at all? You can expound on them, but you, okay. but sorry, say the words. Just first. say the words. Yeah. Okay. Um, this is really hard. And I feel like also like tomorrow I would have a different three words. So yeah. just know that it's fair, right? <laughs> tomorrow it'll be different. Um, but I think my three, mostly three words, it's kind of four words, but my first word is um, expansive. My second word is romantic. And my third word is really two words. But to me, Star Wars sounds foreignly familiar. Mm. So I think... Um, I'm going to put a hyphen. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like, if I can count that as one word, because it's hard to make sense of that. But there's, like, something so familiar to all of the sounds because so many of them came from... Um, if we're thinking sound effects, like so many of them came from things that we've heard before, uh, but then they're put in a foreign context, um, and it it feels different and otherworldly, but also somehow familiar and close to things that we know. That's yeah, that's a great descriptor. I mean, that happens on both the music level and the sound design level, yeah, where all these both. creatures like sound. They sound new, but they definitely also sound kind of like a dog or like kind of like a car or something. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I love that. Um, okay. Question number two. What is something related to Star Wars music or sound that you want to learn more about? So for this, I thought about this a lot. And I think that um, the process of coming up with like character voices or sounds or languages. Uh, It's something I've been thinking about a lot with my work on the book of Boba Fett, um, thinking about like the Tusken Raiders and how they present as um, a more like humanoid type creature, but then uh, vocally they don't have the same sort of language, like, like Hutties. You can easily like have subtitles or you could like write it out phonetically and it like it sounds like a language to us versus um the Tuscans communicating a lot in like hand signs and Mm -hmm. in um they have their like exciting kind of donkey bray kind of sound that they make and so it was just something that I was thinking of um and wondering about just kind of all of the with like the droids when they're communicating and when they're just background noise or like which droids get boops and beeps and which ones get an actual voice Mm -hmm. and kind of that, that process and just how the different characters are presented as like, this one has a human face, but like does not sound like any intelligible sort of language that we could even write out. I love that topic. Um, Yeah. I I really (laughs) like considering the sounds that come out of the physical forms that we see on screen. That's like definitely something I'm really interested in myself. So 
Um, yeah. I, are you going to, are you doing any, um, are you going to make a, write a paper, put a, I want to be in the loop when you yeah, have more. At the moment, no. I okay. just, it's just something that's really interesting that I've been thinking about a lot is like some characters, you know, they present a certain way and you would expect them maybe to sound a certain way and then they don't. And then others, um, you just have kind of these different creature noises. Or like, yeah. like Wookiees, for example, like mm-hmm. Wookiees make sounds and they're obviously communicating, but it doesn't sound like language to us. It sounds like mm. bear noises mixed together with a bunch of other things. Um, but with Wookiees, it makes sense because the puppet doesn't have articulating lips. Right. So the sound must come out of their throat or something. Right. There's like a reason for it. So you yeah. see that kind of um, in different ones and just how... Everyone's communicating with everyone else, but then, you know, there's like with the Tuscans, you don't see a mouth at all. Yeah. So I guess we don't, that's interesting. So I wonder if people could come up with like guesses as to what their heads look like underneath their wrapping based on how yeah, they sound. I have no idea. Yeah. I would always, I'm, I'm interested, like, I am curious if this is ever part of the process. I'm sure it's not, but where instead of coming up with the concept art, the visual, the model or whatever of a creature before recording the voice, I wonder if sometimes the voice is created and then the physical form is modeled based on the voice. I would be mm. very interested in that. Um, yeah. I don't know. It seems... It seems like it would mostly be the other way around. Like, you yeah. know, For here's sure. Jabba the Hut. He's going to sound like, oh, God, oh, you know, and yeah. you're like, oh, yeah, that was, you For know, sure. that was a hut voice, obviously, yeah. because yeah. that's what he looks like. Um, but it would be really interesting to know um, yeah. or to think about, like, if you designed a voice and then you were like, here, here's a sound bite. Draw a character based on that. Well, I feel like it would be an interesting creative exercise. Like, yeah. I don't know, like, oh, okay, we're making new characters. What's our, like, list of aliens? Um, well, I don't know. I think it would be cool to have, like, a voiceover artist or someone who's, like, good at making creative noises and sounds. Yeah. Come up with sounds and then the animators or art concept artists or whatever um, come up with things based on the sound. Lucasfilm, you should do that. that I- <laughs> Right. And you should make a Please. documentary. Yeah. Please would, do that. <laughs> at least doesn't have to be canon, just like for a creative exercise. I'm really curious Absolutely. what you come up with. Um yeah. I guess, you know, anyone listening, invitation to do that. Um Please do. I kind of want to do that now too. <laughs> anyway, um, thanks for sharing that. Um of course. The question, uh, the final question is what is a score or soundtrack that you're fond of besides anything Star Wars? Okay. Uh Well, there's a ton of them, but for right now, what I've been listening to a lot is um, Christoph Beck's work on Frozen 2, and I've been listening to that a lot recently for a project that I am working on um, and thinking about uh, how different instruments and melodies are used to represent both magic and natural elements. So earth, wind, water, and fire, as they appear in the film, they're given an animated form. And then each of them is also like represented with a very uh, specific instrument sound. Um, So that's something that I've been looking at and how uh, the earth elements as a source of magic are kind of depicted in music. Um, So the hopes is that that turns into a fruitful research project. But at the moment, it has just been watching a whole lot of um, Walt Disney Animation Studio uh, films that involve magic and or nature, and then trying to track in kind of that canon um, how music is used to represent those elements of nature and magic, particularly when they overlap. Oh my gosh! I well, that speaking of DSE Ray, <laughs> Frozen Two, yes, <laughs> it's, it's very all over. <laughs> it's, yeah, very DSE Ray. Okay, so I have to know what are are there any preliminary like instruments that you are mapping to certain elements? Uh, so in Frozen 2 in particular, um, you have like, Gail has her like little 
um, kind of high xylophony kind of thing that happens when whenever she comes in. Is Gail um, the mother? She, Gail's the um, sorry. Gail's the wind. Gail's the oh, name Gail's that the Olaf gives okay. to the wind. Okay. Um, okay. So you have it. like a little kind of um, combination of sounds that happen. That's kind of this high chirpy uh, idea that comes with with her. So. Um, huh. So Gail has like a very specific sound sometimes, but then other times um, it's, it's been a little bit hard to isolate them because a lot of the times Elsa is interacting with that element. So then you have oh. like what changes when she's interacting with it. Um, but there is like a, a didgeridoo that comes in with the, uh, the rock giants and like, mm. they're always this like um, very low didgeridoo kind of. Oh, okay. Idea um, on that. Kind of like and Boba then, Fett's theme. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that kind of feel. And then you have uh, voices only used with water. And I thought well, like that was singing voices. Yeah, like singing oh, voice, any kind of, even out. just like vocal ahs in the background or something. Like that goes with water. Um, now that is something that I pick Elsa. up on everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. So that one I was like, yeah, that, that seems to check out that that's going on. Um, and I don't know, I wonder if that's like an intentional reference by composers to the, like how much of the physical human body is made up of water. Like that would be the earth element that the human voice would associate with most Aww. closely. Maybe oh, interesting. I don't know. That's also just maybe like, the flowy nature of of water of the voice and the yeah voice and of water can, can seem so fluid. I don't know. I'm also I, I can't help but think I have of the Phantom Menace Oda Ganga. Um, yeah, yeah. Water is such a and like I think it fits. Like, but but is it because I've seen the association so much that I'm like, yeah, voices for water for yeah, sure. Yeah, that goes right. Yeah. That checks out. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. I'm 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 going to be thinking about that. I I never yeah. would have really made the connection between our bodies being mostly made of water, but of course that is true. So, huh? Right. Oh, well, I can that see voices like, not being yeah. rock. For some reason, that sounds right. Like, of that course, voices like would no. be rock. <laughs> or I think like fire either. Mm, yeah. Um, fire doesn't seem. I, and again, maybe it's that, like, the way it moves. Like, the way water moves, you're like, yes, like, a voice or strings would be a great way to depict that. But, like, the yeah. way that fire moves is very unpredictable, mm. and it doesn't seem as fluid and, like, it would fit well with the human voice. Very interesting. Um, yeah. Cool. Well, uh, thank you for sharing that. Um, of course. Now... Where can people find, or if anywhere, can people find some of your work online? Are you, do you have any uh, published stuff or a YouTube channel, um, anything? I, so I am not uh, big on YouTube or social media at the moment, um, <laughs> but my full talk from the John Williams conference uh, will be available soon. They're working on putting those up on the conference website. Um, so that will be something that, uh, once that's available, I can email that to you if you that would, would like, awesome. um, but that will be something that will be available soon. Um, so it was the John Williams last of the symphonists question mark, um, was the full title of that conference. Uh, and if you search that, it will pull up their website at the university of every in France, and then they will host, um, the videos of the presentations from that conference. Uh, so that will be there. And uh, at the moment, I have given a lot of uh, conference presentations and I'm in the process of turning those into published works. So hopefully in the very near future, there will be those um, published works. Uh, and then those will be on my page uh, through the university, which would be at Clemson University in Clemson, South Carolina. Awesome. Um, I am really excited for when the John Williams conference puts up those talks. So yes, for sure. Um, please let me know. Please let me know. I will. Um, well, thank you once again for coming on the show. Um, it's been so much fun talking to you and my world kind of combined uh, with the main show, which is going through the films. And then I, you know, do live streaming about the TV shows. So definitely my friends and I, uh, <laughs> 
went through all of the Book of Boba Fett as well. Mm -hmm. So this has been really fun. It has been. Thank you so much for having me. And it was great uh, chatting with you and getting to experience these five minutes of Star Wars. Yay. Um, listeners, thank you so much for uh, sticking with the show. Uh, as usual, next week there will be another episode. It will be minutes 71 through 75. Um, and with that, may the force be with you. Uh, thank you for listening to Star Wars Music Minute. <laughs>